Okay, so we'll begin. We're holding Pirkei Avot Perek Revi'i, the fourth chapter, Mishnah Gimel. Hu haya omer. This is a continuation of the previous Mishnah somewhat because it's the same commentator, the same rabbi, Ben Azai. He said, meaning that he very much stressed, he very much taught during his time, that people should be respectful of each other, and therefore he says, Alti baz lechol adam. Never be disrespectful, never look down to anyone, no matter how low he is, no matter what his status is, no matter how ignorant he may be, regardless of the individual. Every human being was created by Tzalem Elohim, the image of God. It makes no difference what his background is, his religion, his faith, the way he looks. Never look down at anyone. Obviously, you know, people uh, come in different classes. I mean, that's just a fact of life. People have uh, different uh, degrees of knowledge and so forth. People are different in many, many ways. And it may be tempting. It may sometimes be tempting for those who are in a higher status to look down, for those who are way beneath them. And but as I says, be very, very careful with that. This is, remember, during the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, somewhat a little bit after that, that these words are being said. And uh, there was this problem of baseless hatred, of not being respectful of each other. A big problem throughout life, in just about any culture, every country, all the times throughout history, that there are those who are disrespectful, who make fun of others. And obviously this is a very important principle because it could help relationships in, many, in more than one way. If there would be the decency, the respect, the kavod, the the mutual respect for each other, it will help so much in realizing that ultimately, even though we are different, and one may be more knowledgeable than the other, or in some way he's wealthier, or whatever it may be, that he has something the other one does not have, nevertheless, we're all humans, we're all human beings. And hopefully everyone still has the image of God on him. I say st hopefully still has because some people don't behave as though they have it. They behave more like animals. But we're talking about normal human beings. One has to make an extra effort in this area only because it's very easy, very easy to be uh, careless and to look down at those who are very, very different than us. In India, this is a problem with the caste system of not being married with those who are forbidden. For some reason, they are forbidden from marrying them because they're a much lower class. Now, even though that's their culture and that's their belief, and you know, and I guess you know, people's beliefs are are important to them, and we don't, of course, make fun of their beliefs. But this does not go in line with the Aftale Recha Kamocha, this does not go in line with what the rabbis tell you, Ze Toldot Adam, Ze Sefer Toldot Adam, as the, the Torah tells us, Adam. Adam is, is a human being that has a Tzalem Elohim on him, regardless of where he's born and in what class he is as a result of his uh, family, you know, raising him in a certain way or raising him in a certain place. So this is what Judaism teaches. And obviously there is, of course, uh, a lot of uh, backing to this. It's not just an a ethical teaching. There's a lot of backing from the Torah, from the words of the Torah alone, that we see that the Torah put tremendous emphasis on the value of every human being, not to kill, not to steal, not to cheat, to treat everybody nicely and so forth. There's a lot of emphasis in this area because it's such an important area. So here the emphasis is on even those who are very, very low, low class. And as we see in the end, towards the end of the Mishnah, he says something very interesting. He says, Alti bas de chol adam ve'haltihi maflik de chol davar, and don't ever exaggerate uh, or don't think that something that you're being told is an exaggeration or, or an impossibility that it cannot happen so soon. Ah, the chances of this happening are so remote. That's called mafligh. In other words, minimizing the importance of it or 
exaggerating it or making it appear as, as though it is, it is exaggerated, that it may never happen. Don't ever say that because she'en lecha adam she'en lo sha'a ve'en lecha davar she'en lo makom. There's no such thing that it, an individual will not have his hour. Every human being, every individual has his time, his hour of success, his hour of luck at some point in his life. And there's en lecha davar she'en lo makom. There's no such thing as something not having its place. In other words, everything in this world may have some time where it will become of benefit to us. And therefore, we should not minimize any human being's value or anything that we see that we think, you know, this doesn't have a value. It may someday have value to it. You know, some people tend to throw away things that in the end, they have to go buy it because they need it. Somehow something happened and that's exactly the screw, the nail, the whatever it is that they need. And they don't have it because they threw it away. They thought, I will never need it. So with human beings and with Dvarim, don't underestimate them, don't minimize their value. They all have some value and they may give you some benefit. We may actually derive some benefit from them at some point in our life. So this, Ben Azai is reminding us, is because it's not only an idea of, of, of uh, thinking of every human being as a creation of God. It's not only that. No. That in itself is something that we should always be aware of and never make fun of anyone. Because levazot, to make fun, to be disrespectful, is to be disrespectful of, all, of the Tzelem Elohim. But besides that, Ben Azai is reminding us, hey, this man or this thing has potential value and at some point in your life you may actually get some benefit from him even though you can never have imagined it because he's a homeless person in the street but one day he'll be the mayor of Los Angeles yes and that's exactly what has happened you know in this city and in other cities where people who nobody thought anything of them eventually got to the top there's a, a cute <laughs> I think it's a midrash that gives uh, this example, it gives it a little bit more uh, clarity. There was once a lion that was asleep. And all of a sudden, a mouse went over and stepped on its feet. And because of that, the mouse woke up the lion. And the lion was very upset. Who woke him up? I'm going to tear him to pieces. <laughs> and he sees the mouse next to him. He says, how dare you do this to me? You know, I can tear you apart. So the mouse tells the lion, I'm sorry, but don't tear me apart. One day, I will be able to help you. One day, I may actually be able to help you. So the lion says, what are you talking about? You can help me. How could you, such a small little thing, help me? So he made fun of him, but he let him go. He said, okay, maybe it's true, but he was making fun of it. One day the lion was caught in a trap that some people put up, set up for wild animals. He was caught in the trap, and he let out a big, big roar. And the mouse was able to hear the roar, and it came to him. He says, you see, now is the time that I'm going to be helping you. I'm going to cut through the rope. And the mouse began chipping away at the rope that, was, that had tied the, the lion, had, that had trapped him. And sure enough, after the mouse was done, the lion was able to escape and get out. So this is just an example of real life, how sometimes we minimize people or minimize something, and in reality, in the end, we end up getting some benefit from this. This is in some ways a continuation to the previous Mishnah where he tells us do every small mitzvah that you encounter, run away from any avera that you, can, that you see. And even if it's a small avera, don't minimize it. So again, the, the connection here is that people sometimes tend to minimize something. Oh, it's a something small. This something small could be eventually something big. It can get you into trouble, this small little avera. So same thing with Adam and with any davar. Don't minimize them. 
they may have some value, if not now, then in the future. In telling us about how serious and how not good Bizayon HaAdam is making fun of people, being disrespectful of them, it is important to recall that sometimes we may do that unintentionally when we give criticism. When we give criticism to children, even though it's, it's correct and acceptable to give some constructive criticism, one has to be extremely careful not to put the child down. You're a nothing. Nothing will ever come out of you. you know, people have done that. And by doing that, especially if they've done it more than once, repetitively, they have broken the child. They have caused him to lose his self-esteem, his confidence in himself. That's emotional abuse. And that's very damaging to a child who is uh, vulnerable, who is sensitive, right? What does a child, how, can, how do you expect a child to react? Even older people are somewhat vulnerable sometimes because everybody with their sensitivities and yet one has to be extremely careful not to put anyone down in such a way, you know. You have to, be, you have to do it in a way that you, you don't hurt his feelings. You know, is that, or at least to reassure him that you mean his well-being. Not chaz shalom to put him down. Ultimately, every human being has potential for gudula, for growth. Some, one day, this young man maybe will become very important, will become very uh, knowledgeable or very successful in some way. And uh, when we look at him, we don't see it, but it can happen. It can happen to anyone. So why look down at him now when every human being does have such a potential of rising to greatness? Somebody who is, for example, not behaving himself, somebody who's not religious, perhaps one day he will do Teshuvah. By looking down at him, by treating him in such a disrespectful way, we are causing him to become distant perhaps, and uh, to lose, uh, for him to lose hope that he has a chance. He has to be reassured that he has a chance that despite the fact that he has failed or that he's all the way down there for whatever reason economically or else, right? He has a chance, he has the potential to grow. So in order for us to motivate that and to help him, it is important that we treat him properly, that we, not, we don't give him the sense that we think that we're better than him, higher than him, and that he's nothing. We see a similar idea in the Torah, in the mitzvah that the Torah commands us, the interes chamor sonachar, or vetztachar masao, you see your enemy's donkey overloaded with cargo, you got to help him out, even though he's your enemy. Now, what does an enemy mean? <laughs> a Jew is not supposed to have an enemy. But an enemy, the rabbis tell us one possibility, one interpretation is this individual is a sinner. And obviously, we don't have too much respect for sinners. So he's treated like an enemy. Not that, he, not that he's a real enemy, but that you don't befriend him. You don't have a kesha with him because of that because he's not behaving himself. He's not going along with the Torah. So you keep your distance from him. But even so, in this situation where he's helpless, where he needs help, we look away from any enmity, from anything that we have against him. We have pity for the animal too. And we try to help him. This is an opportunity actually to bring him closer, to make him change his ways, because when he sees how decent we are, how we don't bear a grudge against him, how we don't take revenge on him. On the contrary, even though there's some distance between the two, we nevertheless come to his, to his assistance, you know, in, in, in his moment of, uh, of difficulty, then he may actually be impressed, positively impressed enough to come back or to change his ways. So why look down, why look or look away and ignore his plight Take advantage of this opportunity, as the Torah commands us to, is to be sympathetic to him and try to help him in any way we can. Maybe one day he will come back. When people make fun of certain things, they sometimes don't realize that even at the present moment, there's some value to them. David the Melech is one example. 
David Melech once asked Hashem, I don't understand, God, why did you create people who are not intelligent? There was people who are retarded, people who are, are, uh, are totally uh, not sane, not you know, healthy in the mind. Why, why, why create somebody like that? He's dysfunctional. He doesn't help humanity in any way. He's useless. People make fun of him, right? He does weird things. I mean, it totally does not contribute. So why allow somebody like that to be created? The other thing he did not understand was, Hashem, why did you make spiders? They make webs all over the place. Who needs spiders? So he had a question about these two, and perhaps some other creatures as well. Hashem says, one day you will see the benefit of these two. When he was running away from Shaul, he went in the direction of an, of a, of an enemy, of a true enemy. Avimelech. Avimelech, yeah. And he remember David is the one that killed Goliath. Right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. So here, this was their opportunity for them to take revenge. And one guy was, I identified him. One guy said, this is David. He went and told the king, you got to put him to death. You know, he, he, he did this to Goliath. You gotta... Anyway, they finally convinced Avimelech that this is Goliath and that he should put him to death. He says, let me take a look at him. Let me first see him. And David and Melech, of course, prayed to Hashem that he should help him be, behave in such a very unusual way that they will never think that it's him. So he behaved pretty much like somebody who is uh, who's not normal, you know, with uh, saliva coming out of his mouth, in, retarded. retarded, totally somebody not sane. And it happens to be that the king, this king, his wife and his daughter were not healthy in the mind either. So he sees this guy who is totally not sane, and he tells the guards, I don't have enough unsane people in my house that you're bringing me some, an additional unsane person. You know, he already has retarded people in his house. In other words, you need to bring me more? I already have enough. You need to bring me some more retarded people? Let him go. This is not him. It can't be David Melech. Somebody like that, behaving like that. So that is how David Melech was saved by behaving like that. And he says, Hashem, I understand now. I guess such people who do not have brains, in other words, who are not sane in their mind, I guess the world has some need for them too. When he was running away again from Shaul Melech, he entered the cave as he was running away. And Hashem sent a spider to cover the entrance of the cave with a big web, immediately. So as they were pursuing him, they came across this cave and they saw this big web. It's not possible that he went in here, otherwise he would have broken the web. So they didn't go search for him. Came out of the cave and he said, Hashem, I now understand that even a spider contributes in some important way to creation, right? In other words, to this world. So Hashem had to show David Melech, who had some doubts about certain things, what are they for? We need all of them. So that is just another idea of why we can't look down, make fun, ridicule anything that Hashem made, because it serves some, some purpose, even though we don't understand what that purpose is. There's a famous story, however, that really serves as a valuable lesson, should serve as a valuable lesson to many Jews who don't understand as well. There was once a, in Israel, a shepherd, but not of sheep and goats, of uh, pigs, a herder of pigs. And that was a very, very low job. He was Roman, and the Jews, the kids, made fun of him. Every time they saw him, they made fun of, there goes such, so and so, the herder of pigs. Years later, somehow, this herder of pigs became the governor of that area. The governor, not even the mayor, <laughs> the governor. 
And he remembered what they did to him, those Jews. And he wrote out an edict, a decree, against the Jews. And the Jews found out about it. Of course, they were very, very saddened, and they didn't know what to do. What should we do? They sent Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, I believe it was, who actually befriended him always, who always treated him nicely. So you go ahead and do it. You go ahead and take care of it. You speak to him. So he agreed, and I think the story was that he went with another rabbi. In any event, when the governor saw him and says, what can I do for you? He says, you know, please cancel the decree. You know that it's, it, it's not fair, it's not right. You know, we're good citizens. So he started, the governor started telling him off, good citizens, what are you talking about? You're the one that made fun of me when I was a child. You're the one that mistreated me. You deserve this now. So the rabbi says, yeah, you know, they made a mistake. They mistreated you because of what you were then, but they will not mistreat you the way you are now. <laughs> so he says, no, it doesn't go that way, he says. You have to be very careful not to mistreat anyone. This is a guy telling them. You have to tell them not to mistreat anyone, not even one who hurts pigs. So what? Just because that's his job, miskin. In other words, poor fellow. You know, bichare, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> hurting pigs, right? So what? You know, one day could be he'll be mayor. One day he'll be president of the United States. <laughs> yeah, this has happened. Yeah. So therefore, alti baz lechol adam. So he canceled the decree just because of the rabbi. He canceled the decree, but he taught him a very important lesson. Look. You can see it for yourself. This is what happened. And this can happen all the time. This Mishnah applies to all times. You know, a person could be low one day, the next day. He could win the lottery and be very wealthy and have control. It could happen in many ways. What about the second, the second item that he mentions in the Mishnah? And don't ever push off things or exaggerate or make believe as though they, they will never happen. There's a famous Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. So this, this is true in anything. I mean, you're going on a big trip. Big trip. Okay? You have to really be planned. I mean, you've got to take yourself food and some water. For the worst case scenario, you've got to take yourself uh, all kinds of things that you may need. Maybe perhaps a flashlight, depending on where you're going. What if there's no gas for the next 100 miles? You know, there are places in the United States where there are signs, the next 100 miles or 50 miles, no gas stations. You better fill up before you go, before you continue. <laughs> How many people get stuck? Right? Ah, oh, it's okay, it will never happen, or it will be okay. No, just don't, don't take a chance. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Don't take a chance. Don't ever take any chances, no, any risks unnecessary risk. Obviously we have bitachon and Hashem, we rely on God for certain things, but when anything that is within our control, we have to do what, what we can. You know, uh, there are all kinds of risks in life that we should not take because things can go wrong, you know. Oh, it's okay if I don't have insurance for one day. I'll get it the next day. It could be something will happen on that day. <laughs> okay, there are many, many kinds of examples. So, don't ever say, oh, this can never happen. Yeah, maybe it will happen. Anything, I mean, you can imagine. In New York, right, they just had a major storm. And there, were, there was an old lady there, 91 years old. She says, it never happened in my 91 years. Yeah. I guess she was living next to the water, maybe. But if you live next to the water, these things can happen. So... Make sure you have insurance, make sure you take, you know, you evacuate, make sure you take whatever precautions you need so you don't get hurt. Don't say this will never happen. Yeah, these things can happen, these things have happened, and you know, what can you do? You know, you, you just have to be careful. There's another example of a rabbi was walking down the beach and he saw a sharp object sticking out of the sand. He says, oh, that's dangerous. If somebody trips over it, he can get hurt, killed. So, and it happened to be, I think, a bone, a sharp bone of an animal or of a human being. So he buried it. Anyway, he comes back the next day, 
a couple hours later, he sees that, that the bone came out, out of the ground. Said, what? So he buried it even more. He covered it with a lot of sand. Later on, he comes back. It's there. It's out exactly where it was before. He says, oh, this must be Minashamayim. They wanted to be there. Mm. For some reason, this bone has to be there. Because that's what our tradition teaches us, that every stone in the street, every rock, every leaf, everything is where Hashem wants it to be. Everything in this world is where Hashem wants it to be. If the rock moved, it's because Hashem wanted it to move. All right, so he left it alone. It was a couple of weeks or months or, or so later, he found out that it was a Roman who was walking by the beach. He had with him a decree against the Jewish community. And he fell, he tripped on it and, and died. And because of that, his letter was never delivered hmm. to the authorities. Meshamayim. Meshamayim, they did not want this to happen. So they, they put this thing there for him to trip. I mean, of course, Hashem could have done it in other ways. He could have had a heart attack. He could have, his boat could have sank. I mean, there's always this, why this particular? Only Hashem knows. You know, that we, we believe in midah, keneged midah, measure for measure. Who knows why it happened, happened in this way. But the point, the lesson, what we need to keep in mind is that everything has a place. It belongs there, it's there for a reason. Hashem wants it there. Going back to, to being respectful of every human being. Rabbis tell us that yesh kone olamo b'sha'achat. It is possible also for an uh, individual to have done the wrong things all his life. During all his life, he did not fulfill mitzvot, he did terrible things, he misbehaved throughout his life. And it could be towards the end of his life, just somehow, he will acquire his world, his world to come in one hour. In other words, in one moment of his life, it could be that he will do teshuvah, that he will repent, regret what he did. And, uh, and as a result of that sincere teshuvah, he has acquired his olam haba. So here is a person who is about to lose everything. His olam haba, because of his behavior, and because of one moment of sincere regret, kone olamo. He has acquired his world to come, his share to the world to come. So what we see from this is that even if we don't ha think that this man has any hope at all, because that's why we think, that's what we see, don't, don't think that way. Because was this man, as bad as he may appear to you right now, <laughs> in one moment he could change. There, there are some incredible stories on the internet from Israelis, especially Israelis, or, or non-Israeli Jews, who if you look at their picture when they were teenagers or 20 years old and so forth, they look very secular with long hair. And 30 years later, you, you see them talking about themselves, and you see them, you look at them with the beard, like they look like rabbis. You say, wow, look at the difference between what he was 30 years ago and what he looks like now. Could this be him? Yeah, an Air Force pilot all kinds of scientists and professionals who have done teshuva, who have repented, who have come back, who have become observant. And they say, and of course, each one has his own story, how he became or how he got to where he got to. And you say to yourself, is this possible? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Especially when we're talking about teshuva, when a Jew, his, his roots, his neshama, is tied to, to the shamayim, always. So it's possible for him that one day that he will come back, especially if his grandfather, great-grandparents in earlier generations in his family were righteous, then there's chutavo too, there's the merits of the, of, the, of the ancestors that will back him, that will support him, that will push him to come back. They don't want to have a, a child, a grandchild, whose chas shalom went off the derech. No grandparent in heaven wants that. So they beg Hashem, please bring him back. And many of them come back. So, it can happen to the one who we, we would never think it would ever happen. Next Mishnah. Rabbi Levitas Ish Yavne Omer Meod Meod Heve Shefal Ruach Shetikvat Enosh Rima. Be very, very extremely humble because the end of all human beings is Rima is the body decomposes and it is consumed by worms. 
what is Rabbi Levitas <laughs> trying to do here? What is he trying to accomplish here? I believe that this Mishnah, like many Mishnayot in Perkei Avot, is connected to the previous Mishnah. In other words, somehow one follows, there's a reason why one follows the other. In this previous Mishnah, we're talking about being disrespectful of people, looking down at people, how it's not right, not correct. Here, Rabbi Levitas is trying to teach us how to get away from that. How can you get away from being disrespectful? How can you look up to people? How can you treat them fairly? He says you have to acquire humbleness. So obviously he's talking about humbleness per se, how important and how valuable and how such beautiful midah it is. But it is also a tremendous tool to assist one who has a problem of looking down at others. If a person is not going to be humble, he's going to have a hard time. He's going to want to look down at others, especially if he's very arrogant. He has lots of money, lots of money. He has $55 million, right? He has a house in Beverly Hills, and he has uh, many carpet stores. <laughs> yeah? Is it still a good business, carpet? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway, somehow he's making money, lots of money. He can easily look down at somebody who, who barely makes, covers his rent. They grew up in the same town. They come from the same place. Perhaps they were even neighbors. Maybe they were even relatives. Look at you. And I never went to college, he says. And you did. <laughs> that makes things even worse, <laughs> right? This is quite normal. So Rabbi Levita says, you want to get away from that? There's one, besides learning Torah, of course, that can help a person, that can reduce his gava, but there's one midah that, is, that punches him in the face. In other words, that really gets him down to realize what life is all about and how we don't have that much time and how this is something so silly for you to, to do or say. And that is humbleness. Humbleness really puts a person in his place. It really makes, allows him to focus better. And therefore he says, why should you be humble? Because in the end we all go to the same place. Tikvat enosh. Enosh means all of humanity. Rima. Rima. Nothing. Nothing is left of this big shot. So obviously he's addressing this especially to big shots. To people who are maghrur, right? Or manfuh in Arabic. You know, people who are full. Hot air. Right? This is the end. And therefore, by having thoughts of rima, by having this kind of thoughts, it will take you down. It's, how could I think about you know, all the money? How could I be so proud? How could I be so arrogant? If in the end, everybody has the same kind of an ending, and it could be sooner than later. Here he says, however, that this midah of humbleness should be me'od me'od. Whereas most of the midot that we see in the Torah, or that the rabbis talk about, as the Rambam does, take the middle of the road. Derechaim tzait. Never go to any extreme. The Rambam points this out. Always be the middle of the road. For example, let's say somebody has a problem. He has a tendency to be stingy. So the Rambam says, how do you cure it? You first go to the other end, and you, you try to be very, very generous, very, very generous. You give a lot of tzedakah. But then, after a while, you come back to the middle. You know, why did I tell you to go to the other extreme? Just to get the stinginess out of the system. But in the end, you have to come back to the middle road. Don't be too giving, too much. You've got to leave something for yourself and your family, right? Don't be the other extreme of just keeping everything for yourself, right? Same thing with anger, same thing with laziness. I mean, these, all these midot, even though laziness, obviously, it's not so much the middle, but you sometimes want to be lazy and not do bad things. For bad things, you should be lazy. But all the midot in general, the Raman says, just go in the middle. Don't sleep too little, don't sleep too much. Just sleep average, eight hours or so, right? Eating, same thing to do, over the, don't overeat. I mean, if you want to eat less, once in a while you're on a diet, it's okay, but every midah is always healthy if it's the middle. You sometimes need it, and sometimes, obviously, you don't want to use it. Here he says, me'od, me'od, with this midah, go to the other extreme. Be very extremely humble. Me'od, me'od means extremely, a lot more than the other midot. Why? 
Because the opposite of humbleness is gava, the arrogance. And arrogance leads to a lot of sins. So the Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Levitas is telling us, stay away as much as possible from that ugly midah called arrogance. And the way to stay away from it is by being the opposite of being humble. This Mishnah, of course, is a very significant Mishnah for the following reason. Humbleness is not just a good midah. Humbleness will help an individual in his relationships. We just said that if a person is humble, it will help him not look down at others because he says to himself, okay, I have more than he does, but he is smarter. He has something more than I don't. In other words, there's always a way to find some credit in the other individual more than we have. In other words, this can, this can help someone avoid arrogance. In other words, he can always find something good about the individual. The only, but to, to think this way, you have to be humble. Now, that's in general. But, but in between a husband and a wife, it's especially important because if there's no humbleness there, if a person thinks that he's better and she's nothing, she doesn't know how to cook. She never held a job. She doesn't know how to sew. I mean, nothing! He starts, he starts making a list in his mind. And he basically loses all respect for her. And this could be the other way around too. With some women who they, you know, who thinks they who knows what they are. I brought in all the money. I'm the one that runs the house. And this husband, this man of hers, knows nothing. He comes from some village in Kurdistan. You know, they barely taught him how to read. Yeah. So what? He could still be a decent human being, a nice person. Doesn't hurt anybody honest, just because he's not knowledgeable, just because he's not wealthy. You see, it's a lack of humbleness. When there's a lack of humbleness, it could, it could ruin a relationship. It could ruin it. Because people, depending on the individual's character and his personality, some people have that in their personality. And if they're very knowledgeable or wealthy, plus they are like that in their personality, ooh, they make fun of everyone. And then you have the people who make fun of rabbis, who make fun of religion. They just, they love, they're they the, the clowns, the mockers, who make fun of everything. They, they, they're, they're in a lot of trouble because people, as we, we've explained this in the past, people who are mockers, who love to make fun of things, they're going to have the hardest time doing teshuvah because they will never accept criticism. Anything you ever tell them, they'll make fun of. They'll, they're they're going to think that they're always right. So the, these are the people that almost, they're almost considered lost cases. I say almost because I don't want to believe anyone is a lost case. But the Rambam pretty much says the chances of this ever, of this guy ever coming out of it, or becoming normal, are very, very slim. And that is what happens in marriages too that are so sour after many, many years. After, if it's after many years for them to come out of it, and start from scratch is difficult because they've lost respect and trust for each other. The trust has eroded. It's gone. If there's no trust, then there won't be any respect. There won't be trust or respect. What's left? You know, just sharing the house? Not everybody wants to live that kind of a life. They, they, they want attention. They want love. They want warmth. They want security. They want to feel that they're a part of this relationship. But if the man or the woman doesn't treat the other one right. It's like they have no say. It's like they're worthless. They're nothing. So of course it's going to fall apart. Who wants to live like that? Most people don't want to live like that. I mean, you tell God, tolerate it. Be patient. <laughs> Not today. Maybe 150 years ago in Isfahan, maybe they tolerated each other. Right? But today, they don't want to tolerate each other. They want to live, uh, they want to be, they want to have a peaceful life. They want to have a partner who's cooperating. And if, if something goes wrong, no, this is not for me. That's why me'ot me'ot ve'shefaruach, humbleness, is such an important midah to work on, because if a person is not going to be humble, then he won't be accepting of other people who, are, who, are, who maybe are, are less than him. I mean, it's possible they are less than him. So what? If you're humble, you don't see that, that how they're less. You treat them as, an, as a human being. Rabbis tell us, by the way, somebody who's humble, the Torah reminds him, what is such a big shot? The flea 
was created before you. Right? In the order of creation, man is created at the end, on the sixth day. There's a lot of other things, including the flea that was created before you. So who are you? you know, there's a flea that came before you. Right? So, <laughs> obviously, there, there's a lot of things that, that can help a, an arrogant person, if he wants to help himself. There's a lot of things that he can think about that hopefully will put him in his place. So even though here we're saying that it's a very important idea, a very important quality to be humble, because ultimately everybody goes to the grave, rabbis tell us, don't do it 100%. Do it 99%. Keep one-eighth of an eighth, which is one-sixty-fourth, of gava. Keep, keep one-sixty-fourth. Wow, I should keep one sixty-four. It's not a lot, right? Yeah, keep a little bit, because you have to have what's called in English self-esteem. That's called self-esteem. The one sixty-fourth, the eighth of an eighth of gava is called self-esteem. If a person doesn't have some kavod atzmi, that he respects himself a little bit, that he he understands that he has some, if he completely doesn't think anything of himself, it's no good either. It could lead to other things that are not right and not healthy. A person has to have some self-esteem, some worth. Even though rabbis have been known to ignore people who have made fun of them. And uh, there was even a story of a guy, a big rabbi who was traveling by boat, and a, and a non-Jewish youngster urinated on him on purpose. He didn't react. And he says, he writes, I could have reacted, and perhaps I would have under normal circumstances, but I was in the process, at that time, of training myself to be 100% humble. So I, de I decided to ignore it. You know, as I was trying to conquer myself and not to react, because and most people would have reacted to that in all kinds of ways, <laughs> right, to something like that. But he was in the process of teaching himself, of training himself to be very humble. So he stopped himself. But uh, there are times where a person cannot be mochel, cannot, be for, cannot just forgive or ignore something that is happening that is against the Torah, I mean, that is, that is putting the, the Torah down, Shalom. not even the person, the Torah in him, his position, what he represents. There are times that we have to protest. That we can't just ignore. So a person cannot just say, oh, I'm nothing, worthless, uh, zero. No, no. First of all, everyone is a Tzalem Elohim, so you're not nothing completely, right? But the, self, but the value, the self-esteem is important for people to be motivated and encouraged to, to work on themselves, to further elevate themselves, to not lose hope and not despair, that perhaps one day they, they will make a difference in somehow in, in their families or in the world, in their communities. You know, a person should never give up hope, but if he doesn't have any self-esteem, then the chances are not so good. If a person has some self-esteem, that that will give him the drive that people need. We all need the drive to continue to do what we believe in is right and to improve and to get ahead in life. That's why the rabbis tell us 164 is retained, but not more than that. Before we go into the last Mishnah, just want to remind you that Anava, humbleness, is a very big midah. Rabbis extol this midah. Extol means that they praise it very, very much. It's a midah that has very, very good consequences in many ways. Hashem loves these people who are humble. Not only does the Torah come easier to people who are low and humble, the Torah does not, is not, is not retained in somebody who's arrogant, just like water flows to a lower place, a lower spot, so the Torah, which is compared to water, only goes to those who are low. Besides that, Rabbi tells a person who is anav, his tefilato enonim eset. Hashem never will despise his prayers. A person who is truly a humble man, Hashem always listens to his prayers. He doesn't, dis doesn't look away from his prayers. Tremendous blessings come through a person who is humble. There's tremendous benefit that uh, besides that the fact that people will appreciate him, that he's liked, the Shekhinah is with him. So, rabbis talk about all the great benefits that a person 
will be able to acquire as a result of being or behaving in a humble way. So it's a, it's a very important midah. It's a, it's a midah that people need to work on all the time. And it's a midah that if people succeed, it will definitely make a big difference in, in many aspects, in many areas of their life, including in the relationship, as we said before. All right, here, the second part of, it's, here it appears as a second part of the Mishnah. In other books, it will appear as a separate Mishnah. Very, very strong statement here, talking about Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem is the desecration of God's name. Whoever profanes or desecrates God's name in private, Baseter, they will exact punishment of him in public. When it comes to the sin of Chilul Hashem, desecrating God's name, it makes no difference whether a person did it intentionally or unintentionally. Even though there is some difference, of course, by Shemaim, but as far as what will happen, it doesn't make a difference. This is such a serious sin that it, the consequences will be felt in this world, by the way, not, in all, not only there. Something will happen to him in his life. And... If it was done, but said that it, what will happen will be in public. Everybody will become aware of it. So we need to understand a little bit what is this Chilul Hashem all about and why is this such a serious sin. <coughs> For the Jew, his main purpose in life, his main existence is for what purpose? To sanctify God's name. That's what a Jew is all about. When Hashem has, what is it, uh, how many billion Chinese? 1.2, 1.3, in India also, and a lot of cre creations that Hashem made, a lot of human beings, that serve some purpose too. Everything that Hashem made serves a purpose, we said. The Jews' purpose, the Jewish nation's purpose is unique. Hashem created us, formed us, chose us to sanctify His name. That's briefly what the, the purpose of the Jewish nation is. Kiddush Shem Shamayim in the world, to elevate the Shem name in the world. To sanctify him, that people should become aware of him. So if God forbid a Jew does any maaseh which is contrary to that, which desecrates the name of Hashem, it's very, very serious. Very, very serious. Not only is he going against his purpose and his mission, but something else happens that people are unaware of. Chilul comes from the word halal, a vacuum. The Shekhinah fills the entire universe. And when a Jew commits a Chilul Hashem, at that moment, on that spot, there's become a vacuum. On this spot, Chalila Bechas, there's no Shekhinah. It's like he drove it away. By certain actions, certain actions of course, that he committed, that he perpetrated, that's what they cause. It's not only a terrible sin to himself, to what it does, the damage to himself, it's a damage to the world. People don't think of it that way, but when sins are committed, it does something to the world. It's not just to, the, to us as individuals. A mitzvah does something good to the world. A avera, a transgression against it, does something to the world. A chilul Hashem, which is the worst, one of the worst sins of all, does tremendous damage. And because of the tremendous damage, that's why they're not easy with him. And what's the damage here? What, it's, first of all, it's a damage which is very difficult to repair. There's other things that one can do Teshuvah for. For this, you cannot do Teshuvah. In other words, the Teshuvah will be taken and received by Hashem, but that will not be sufficient for an atonement. His atonement will only come when he dies. That's how terrible Chilul Hashem is. That no, no suffering will be enough to cure him. You know, suffering sometimes cures, it's atones, mechaper, kapara, tzedakah, teshuvah, tefillah, all of that will help, but will not complete the job. When will the job be completed after he did the real teshuvah? Only when he dies. That's how serious it is. Because the damage that was done cannot be easily repaired. And when damage cannot be repaired, you know, it's, it's obviously more serious. But what's, what's so serious besides the damage that's being done? In other words, what is really happening? 
what's really happening is that those who observed him, their emunah in God has become weaker as a result of that. So the Chilul Hashem means that there is damage done to the emunah that he is supposed to be practicing, that he is supposed to be demonstrating, that he is supposed to be behaving according to those beliefs. And here he did something which goes exactly contrary to those beliefs. Wow, this guy did this, and he is Jewish, and he is observant, and he has a, he, and he's, he has a beard, and he keeps Shabbat, and he did this? You see, you see what I mean? It's a big shock. It's a shock wave. And that shock wave is very damaging to those who are observing this Maaseh. And people think, you know, it's a Goy. If a Goy observes the Maaseh, mm, it's terrible. It's true. One has to be very careful not to do any Chilul Hashem in the eyes of a Goy. Because he will say, oh, the Jews are thieves, the Jews are liars, the Jews are crooks. They stole. They cheated. So the Goy will take it very, very badly. And the Zohar speaks about it, what repercussions this has when the minister of the Goyim says, oh, there goes Yaakov again and steals from Esav. In other words, it has consequences. It's terrible. But the Chilul Hashem by Jews is even more serious. If a Jew sees that, it's more serious. Why? Because he may learn from that. He's a Jew who is responsible for mitzvot as, well, as much as any other Jew. And if he sees that guy who's supposed to be religious behaving in a, such a way which is very contradictory of what he believes, it may have an effect on him, chaz v'shalom. It may take him off the derech. It may make him lose faith, lose his faith. In other words, his faith may be weakened as a result of that. And that's why Chilul Hashem for other Jews who are observing is much more severe. And that is now we understand why the rabbis were so careful in various halachot with the concept of marit ayin. Marit ayin means don't do this, even though it may be permissible according to the halacha, because others may misinterpret your, your actions. An example of marit ayin, for example, is let's say something is fully cooked. The halacha says you can't just take it out of the refrigerator and warm it on Shabbat, on the stove, directly on the stove. Even though we hold, the halacha is that there's no cooking after cooking. Once it's cooked, you're not cooking it. There's no isur from Shabbat to re-warm something that's already cooked. What's the isur of the Rabbanan? It has, there's various details and parts to it, but one idea behind it is marit ayin. When you put it back on the stove, somebody who may be looking at from the window into your house says, Oh, I just saw him take something from the refrigerator and cook on Shabbat. And he doesn't know that it was already being cooked. You follow me? That's called Marit Ayn. Right? Somebody working on your house, doing some construction on your house on Shabbat. You can't let him come into your house and paint. Paint. But even though he's doing it on his own, he's a sub, he's a contractor, whatever. You didn't tell him to come to Shabbat. He wants to do it. You can't let him do it. Why? Because people going, going down the street will say, oh, he, he went to Pico and hired some guys to come paint. And that you can't do on Shabbat. But they don't know that you didn't hire them on Shabbat. They think, you know, I mean, that's what they think. The, where, where we know the reality is you hire them to do the whole job. And if that would be the case, Allah would permit it. You hire them to do the whole job. Finish it, do it whenever you want. I want this done in six months. The problem is people see it. They don't know what you made up. Right? There's a lot of problems with Marit Ayn. You know, people see you, eat, people see you in a non-Jewish restaurant, that's a marit ayin too. What are you doing there, sitting down and eating? They don't know, they don't realize that you're eating your own food that you brought with you into the restaurant. They don't, they don't know, oh, he's eating taref. No. He's, so don't do that. Don't let people make certain wrong assumptions. It's a chilul Hashem too. Especially if they see you with a kippah. So you have, that's called marit ayin. A person has to be careful with anything that can lead to a marit ayin. What it means what the eye can, may, may see and may misinterpret. Right? Even though it's, it's okay, but people don't think so. And we have to, unfortunately, I mean, we have to be careful with people's uh, judgment of us, even though we, we, our attitude may, may be, oh, we couldn't care less what others say. 
Sometimes that's okay, depending on what you're doing. Let them say what they want. But at others, at other times, and most of the time, Adam Sechelat said Yedea Briot. In the same way that a person has to be Yotse Yedea Makom Yedea Hashem, that Hashem should be happy with him, you have, one has to do his best that people should be happy with him, that people should not see him in the wrong light, as much as possible. So sometimes you can't just say, no, let them think what they want. First of all, you're going to get a, wrong, a bad reputation. And number two, they're going to, they may learn the wrong thing by misinterpreting it. So sometimes those behaviors can be a chilul Hashem if it's something so contrary to what the Torah says. The Gemara brings down a couple of examples. I'll just share one. Rav said, you know what's an example of chilul Hashem where he would be committed, committing or guilty of a chilul Hashem? If I walk to the butcher, go into the butcher, buy meat and don't pay. People might say, oh, he doesn't pay. He's a thief. You know, people may get the wrong impression. Here's a rabbi coming in and taking stuff without paying. It doesn't look right. They don't know what arrangement he may have, that he's buying on credit. People are, oh, you know, he was supposed to pay, he didn't pay. I've seen situations, I was once in a, in a, in a bakery where I, I don't know how good of an idea it was, but perhaps it did help, where people had bounced checks and they put copies of those bounced checks. They hanged, they hanged them on the board for people to see, perhaps in this way. I don't know how good of an I don't know if that's such a good idea because it could be a chilul Hashem too. I mean, here you're contributing to that and like publicizing it. You know, I don't know if it's such a good thing, depending how many checks he bounced, perhaps. <laughs> but obviously bouncing a check is very serious. Unless, of course, it happened once and it was a mistake. I mean, call up and take care of it. You don't want the other person to think for even one moment, oh, he paid. There was, he knew that there was no funds. You know, he's a, he's a crook. He's not an honest guy. Even though it could be an honest mistake, he never checked his account, he didn't realize that it was minus or zero or whatever. You have to be very careful of this because you don't want to get penalized either. You don't want to pay penalties. But besides that, there's always the potential of Hilul Hashem if people see it the wrong way, depending, of course, on the amount of money, depending on the circumstances. But that would be an example of what Rav was talking about, being careful not to have people talk negatively or react in such a way where, where you know, they will, be, they will be surprised, you know, this is not lo matim lo, this is not something that is, that, uh, that he's known to do, you know, we thought he was religious, we thought he was a nice, honest guy, and here we see the opposite. The greater a person is, of course, the more people expect of him. So if a senator commits a crime, you know, <laughs> you know, like they're all being caught, you know, or doing something, then obviously people say, oh, wow, you know, look at this, the senator, the president, the uh, vice president. The higher the position one is, one is in, the more they expect of him, the integrity in here. If it, if it shows the opposite, it's terrible. You know, people lose faith. In, in the system. They have no trust. They don't trust it anymore because they're all corrupt, they say. And they're right. <laughs> a good number of them are corrupt. And, he, and even if it's only a couple, a few people, they still give a bad name to the whole system. Anyway, because for the Jew, for the Jew that is his mission, then he has to be extra careful. He has to be extra careful in his conduct, in his speech, in his business dealings, much more than anybody else because he wants to be a good example for everybody to look at and for everyone to learn from. The Mishnah finishes up over here that Shogeg and Mezid are the same, intentional and unintentional are, are the same, because it's difficult to correct, to fix the damage. So even though it's Shogeg, it was unintentional, because the damage was done, the Hashem looks at it in almost at the same way. What does it mean that they expose them in public? So let me tell you a quick story. It happened many years ago where on Yom Kippur, somebody's house collapsed on him. And he was found dead, of course, with food in his mouth. So the community realized that, that this was, of course, was Minash Shamaim, that this Chilul Hashem that he was causing, that, that he was eating in private, eventually got exposed. Now, why would Hashem expose it? 
if this was in private. When we say baseter, by the way, that it's being done in private, there's various interpretations. Some say what could be done in private that is such a chilul Hashem. Swearing falsely, worshiping idols, these are all could be done quietly and it's still a chilul Hashem. Because usually chilul Hashem is in public. But chilul Hashem could also be amongst a few people. Only a few people know of it. And now Hashem says, I'm going to make it public. But why make it public? Because a, a good number of people who do things privately because they don't want to be caught in public, and they do something which is a terrible sin, they are looked at as tzvoim. Tzvoim. Doru. Two-faced. Hypocrite people, right? People who are two-faced. People think of them as being religious, as, as praying half an hour, putting on tefillin, two sets of tefillin. Rashi and Rabbi Nutam. Oh, there must be tzaddikim. And then you see them in real life, and you see that these guys are, are garbage. These guys are rotten. These guys are thieves. And there are people like that, believe it or not. They're called tzavua, tzvoim. Today, the animal that's called tzavua in Hebrew is the hyena. You know? He laughs, and he... he just that kind of, a, of a, an individual who is not to be trusted. He's two-faced. And uh, we, it's hard to, to be careful with them. We don't know who they are. So you have to be careful. You always have to be careful. Because you never know by the outside appearances what is inside this person's heart and the mind. But here, Hashem says, for something like this that is a chilul Hashem, for the particular avon that he did, that is completely not compatible with his mission as a Jew, with what he's supposed to behave, the example that he's to, to show and teach others, this is so damaging what he's doing that he has to expose his hypocrisy. And the Maasim, unfortunately, has to come out in public. And that's when people see, oh, you see, he got part of the part of the punishment he got that it's exposed and the shame that goes through it, and the people eventually find out about it. With Goyim, of course, one has to be careful with the Chilul Hashem. Why? You would think it's the same thing. No, no. People sometimes take Goyim, a Jew sometimes takes them very lightly. Ah, he's only a Goy anyway. Famous story with Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach that he bought a donkey from an Arab. And when the, his students were cleaning him up and getting him ready with a saddle or whatever, they discovered the diamond on him. So they told the rabbi, Rabbi, you can retire now. Baruch Hashem, Hashem loves you. He gave you a donkey and a diamond. <laughs> now you, you, you won't have any worries. He says, no, you have it wrong. I bought a donkey and I didn't buy a diamond. He went back, sent back the diamond to the Arab. And the Arab says, Baruch, the Hashem, blessed be the God of this Rabbi ben, Shimon ben Shatach. It's Kiddush Hashem. He sanctified God's name. Who would do that? Right? People find wallets. People have found thousands of dollars. And there have been some nice, good citizens that have returned it, but not everybody does. Why would somebody return $20,000? It's cash. There's no, no name and nothing on it. I mean, well, if there's no name, then obviously it's, it's going to be more of a problem to return it. But there is, there is a way he can return it, but he chooses not to. A taxi driver, there have been many, many stories of people leaving behind stuff. Some of them have brought it back, and some of them, I'm assuming, did not bring it back, did not give it back. Go find him. You know, go. Anyway, so that is why with Goyim you have to be extra careful because only because some people take it lightly. Oh, it's okay, he's a Goy, what is, you know. There's no such thing. Gezer from a Goy is a Sur to steal, just the same like anybody else. He's a human being. There's no hetem, no permission to be. On the contrary, you're, you're, you're running the risk of a very easy Chilul Hashem by compromising your emunah in the, in, in, through this kind of an act. All right, just to finish up, Chilul Hashem is unfortunately something that is, is very damaging. It causes tremendous damage to the individual himself, causes damage to the world, and uh, sometimes people in their rage, in their chaos, in their anger, and the, and the gava too, don't realize that through their ma'asim, they're causing a chilul Hashem, especially if it's in public. And they believe that what they're doing is right. 
You know, they have to, you are, one has to be extremely careful if, if, if certain action will lead to machloket and chilul Hashem. Avoid it at all costs. Run away from it like fire. Be careful because it's, it's, it's a very, very serious avon. What should a person do if Chaz Shalom he made the mistake of committing certain things that were in public? Certain, you know, because it's in public, it's very difficult to repair, you know. And uh, what should he do nevertheless? As we said before, it's very difficult to repair. Is there anything that he could do to, to fix it? Is there anything? And the answer is yes. The best way for a person to do any, any repair work to the Chilul Hashem is Kiddush Hashem. Sanctifying Hashem's name. Besides his Teshuvah, besides repentance, besides Tefillah, to ask Hashem for forgiveness for this terrible sin, besides all of that, he should look for ways to be Mekadesh Hashem Shemai. And by sanctifying Hashem's name, there is a chance that without Hashem, his Teshuvah will be complete. Because Kiddush Hashem is a tremendous mitzvah. It's a tremendous ma'aseh. In the same way that Chilul Hashem is so terrible, a Kiddush Hashem, especially Kiddush Hashem Berabim, whoo, all those who sanctify God's name by, by, uh, by dying for what they believe and not worshipping the idol and not doing something against the Torah, that's a Kiddush Hashem. Right? Anybody who will sanctify God's name is in a tremendous high level. So that is a very, very powerful mitzvah, powerful ma'aseh, that if a person has such an opportunity to do, he should do it. Obviously, one does not have to look for big, big ma'asim. As long as a Jew behaves himself properly, in his conduct, in his speech, in his business dealings, as long as he does everything right in his marriage, everything, everywhere he goes, people look up to him, people only have good things to say about him, that's also Kiddush Hashem, right? Because this is, this is the way people can learn. This is the only way people will learn, because they see he is a model. He practices what he preaches, he represents the, what he believes in very, very well. Oh, then that makes an impression on people. People want to, to, to be like that. People look up to that. That is very, very comforting. That is very encouraging, and that is how one per, that is how one can bring others back with Chuba as well. When they see, wow, this is so beautiful. This is so nice. Maybe I should adapt it. Maybe I should try it out. When one brings other people back with Chuba, that is the biggest kiddush Hashem of all because he has saved neshamot, saved souls, brought them back, taught them, and you have today people who are balei Chuba themselves who are bringing back others with Chuba. So you can imagine that this, what they're doing is more than compensating and, and fixing what they've done wrong for so many years. They're actually, it's a tremendous mitzvah. But you see Hashem, Baruch Hashem, put them in the position to repair. If you're good, for, if you're good with this, go ahead and do this. This mitzvah of bringing others to Shuvah, there's no doubt, it's one of the, the biggest mitzvot, especially of our generation, when there's so many souls that are out there that are lost and drifting. So here's an opportunity for people to do a real Kiddush Hashem to bring as many Jews without Hashem back with Shubha. Thank you.